Kevin, welcome back to the podcast. It is a pleasure to be here with you, my friend. Thank you so much. Um, it's a, I've been, anytime I spend with you is a, is a joy, that's for sure. Well, that's how I feel too. We always hang out and the time flies and we learn a lot. Uh, at least I learn a lot from you. So, <laughs> And uh, you've been on the show before. And at that time we talked about you know our work together through Rethink, where you were the guy who got this podcast started almost five years ago and uh, helped us get to number one on iTunes and, you know, helped this guy who still works out of his basement to gain an audience. It was it was a great interview, and we'll link to that in the show notes. But I want to drill a little bit deeper on platform building with you today and personal branding. Um, what is wrong with... <laughs> how people are doing personal branding and platform building today. Why don't we just start there? What's faulty about it? Yeah, I think the challenge is one, it's all about them. Hmm. I think that's probably the, the number one, the number one problem and it all kind of flows from there. Uh, so thanks to you and many others, I've gotten heavy into the Enneagram. Uh, <laughs> I, was a, I, I, I too was a little late to the party. So what are um, you? I'm yeah, I'm, I'm a two wing three. Okay, I thought there has to be a little bit of three. To yeah, KJ. yeah, that's right. Two, yeah. Yeah, two wing, two wing, three. And so, with that being said, I think you know. So, I'm not. I don't make this all about Enneagram, but the people who are drawn to even want to build a platform and want mm. to scale their influence. Those in de- those who do it with joy and desire. And so, I mean, my wife is very influential, but she does it reluctantly. You know, she's a two wing one. She wants to stay to herself and just help people. She's the heart of a, ph- a philanthropist. So those individuals are threes, they're eights, right? They're individuals who either are completely content, challenging status quo, like throw your darts at me, bring it on, I don't care. Or they're those who are just desiring this overwhelming love of affirmation, adoration. And so what happens naturally, I mean, and I think I can put myself in that boat as a person who struggles with this, and that is making sure it never becomes about us. Hmm. Be, and, 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 and how do we do that? And so that's one issue I think the other big thing is we don't know ourselves. Yeah. And so that's a big challenge because that means if you don't know who you are and you start to scale a facade of who you are, you're in big trouble <laughs> because, you, because you, you look up and you're like, you feel you can build your own prison. Truthfully, you can build your own prison and you're miserable because the whole world sees you in a way that you are not. Wow. And maybe you and maybe you didn't do it on purpose. I've seen people sincerely who did not know they did that to themselves, and then they're miserable. Um, now there are those who've done it on purpose, and then they're still miserable because they say, "I now have enough money where I want to be me. I want to do what I want." And now the world's like, "But that's not who you are to us. You are this person." Um, look, look at Michael Jordan, right? Michael Jordan yeah. played into it for a long time of in his career. Be like Mike. I want to inspire all the kids. He latched onto a marketing and branding campaign that did not represent who he was. Hmm. I, I I just challenge anyone to go find me an inspirational talk from Michael Jordan for kids. They like just, I mean, you might find one too, but go on YouTube. You're not going to find hundreds of them because that's not who he is. Interesting. So you're that's, saying, I didn't know that about Michael Jordan's story, that that was kind of a branding thing. Like it would be good for you at this point to be about charity and that's right. but that wasn't that wasn't him. Kids looked up to him. I mean, he wasn't even he wasn't actually at the time a bad role model. Um, but and so he played into it. Be like Mike had a nice ring to it. Yeah. Widen and Kennedy, the the you know the renowned ad agency in Portland, Oregon, whose Nike's uh, agency of record for decades jumped right mm-hmm. on it, built a fantastic campaign. But Michael Jordan also had a gambling problem, and he gambled. And he, and he, but he didn't care. He was rich. He would, he would, he would, he would gamble. I guess you can lose a million, right? Like if you're that a, rich. He would gamble at Atlantic City, be out to 3, 4, 5 a.m., be at the game on time and still dominate. Wow. So he, so I'm saying to say that, so for, I think some people that that's a, that's an anomaly to say he did not make any decisions that imploded his life in that journey. But some of us build lives and build a facade that we can't keep up because it's not who we really are. So self-awareness is also a big issue in the in the platform building space from my experience. So how does that happen? Because I think you're right. You can end up building a public persona, whether you're leading a company or a church of 100, you know, real small business, 
or, or even you're trying to be one way to your friends or you're building this brand on Instagram or social right. or blogging or YouTube or wherever you happen to be. But what are, how does that happen to somebody? Well, I, I think it's twofold. I, I don't think it always starts out negatively. Um, uh-huh. I mean, obviously there are a lot of people who I've seen who get into this space of, of building their own brand online, building an audience who come from very painful pasts. Mm-hmm. and they've been in places where they didn't matter. They felt like they were neglected and they felt like they were picked over or ignored. And so yeah. they are meeting needs that only God can fill <laughs> through the, through, the, through an audience. Yeah. And that leads to some dangerous places over time because, well, who cares what my kids think? Who cares what my wife thinks? My audience thinks I'm awesome. And I'm going to, and I'm going to lean into the people who, who I can, who, whose love I can measure through likes. Um, and, and, and that mm. leads to some dangerous places. Um, so yeah. the question I ask people is like, why do you even want to be, do, why do you want to do this? Like what, like seriously, like what, what's going to make you do this when no one's paying attention? Now, once again, I work for Dave Ramsey. I work for Tony Robbins. I work with Carrie Newhoff. These, you, you all are strong eights. So opposition mm-hmm. to you all actually is kind of affirming in this weird way. Like, let's bring it on. Let's go. Yeah, get yeah, up, no, you it know? is like, bring it on. Like, what do you, yeah. what do you got? Exactly. Yes, you all might be impacted by negative like, like any other human being would, but negative comments in some ways are almost a spark that you're doing something right. You know, like, yeah, you know, like, yep, that's right. You're uncomfortable. That's what I'm hoping. I'm trying to change the world. Well, and I no, don't please, know whether I get this right all the time, and I'm sure I don't, but like the nice thing about what's happened so far is I feel like I get to roll out of bed every morning and just be me. You know, which is it's so liberating because I'm not worried about reinventing the wheel. I'm not worried about, oh, I got to do this because I'm supposed to. It's like, actually, I'm not going to blog today. So yep. I'm just not going to do it. Or, yeah, I'm going to write something and I don't know whether it's going to help people or not. Or, yeah, that wasn't the best intro in the world, but it was it was a good one. And, uh, you know, like I, th- there is there's a tremendous power in a freedom, I guess, not even power, but a freedom in being able to be yourself as opposed to trying to imitate other people. So sometimes that arises out of a wound. Uh, Does it happen sometimes like because people feel, well, if I'm going to be successful, I need to be X or I need to be Y or they're imitating? Like what are some other reasons? Yes. So that happens too. So sometimes people are so strategic, they actually undermine their own mission. Hmm. And I know I'm a strategist. So, so saying that out loud feels a little weird, uh, yeah. but it's true in okay. the sense that if I, if I take the Carrie Newhoff playbook and I literally dissect everything you've done, and I'm all about modeling, Tony Robbins teaches people to model, learn from the greats, success has clues, all that stuff, but I can't be Carrie. Like, right. and, and so, so, so if I go from writing deep philosophical content and 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 I'm and everything's very metaphorical in my nature, how I'm my writing style, and I go to a what what I feel you do a very good job of prescription style writing. Three ways, seven ways. You are right. naturally one that likes to decode into a system or method. And if that's not who I am, it, it's it may not work for me. And so what happens is the more you try to literally follow someone's blueprint to the point where you are stripping out any ounce of who you are, it hurts you. And once again, Eights and threes, people are, who are, they do that most often, if I'm just being transparent, because they're so driven to be successful. So, uh, it's, it's, so we would it's, be the people who are anything. most most tempted to most imitate tempted. something that we're not. Exactly. Be- because because oh. because be, you're growth driven. If you're if, if you're growth driven, yeah, if I'm you're success driven, then you're like, well, what did they do that worked? Tell me, give me the give me the plan. Let me strip out what I want for it. I'm going to go use it. And sometimes that means neglecting our own gut um, for the sake of building the audience, for the sake of even the mission. I mean, everyone who's listening to this podcast has a desire to reach more people. Yeah, yeah. You know, you, you, have an, you have an audience that's disproportionately represent, representing that community of people saying we want to. Yes, Kevin, we're making a transformation of the people who come to our church. The people we serve with our business are love our products, but we want more of them. We, mm-hmm. We're not satisfied. We're not content with, with, with that. We think God has more for us and we want to go get it. And what that leads to at times is what did they do that worked for them? And I'll just slap that plat strategy on. We'll give it a go. And if it works now, whatever we did that may not have felt like who we are, we're stuck. Cause now we know where it was driving attendance. We know what's driving sales 
And we don't want to walk away from the strategy that got us here, no matter how weird it feels to us. We are we are David in Saul's armor and we're going to, but we're winning the fight. So let's just keep the armor on. Isn't that interesting? So I don't want this to become too meta, but you and I have got quite a bit of experience together and have partnered together so often. So when you look back on like when we were launching the podcast and the blog and books and things like that, what are some junctures? Because I've never, I don't want to say I've gotten it perfect. I don't think I've gotten it perfect, but I've never really felt that pressure. You know, I've never felt the the pressure to, because we've, we even like monetization. Do you remember how long we waited on the podcast? I do. It's like, let's just build trust. Let's not worry about that. The money will take care of itself one day and we'll be able to pay the bills at some point. And, you know, we're just going to build a, a rapport with, with, so what, adv- I guess you could either look back on sort of our experience together and say, well, what, what are the parts we got right? Um, or what are some things that you can do to avoid getting into that ditch where you become somebody you're not, whether that's minor or major. Yeah. So I didn't do this with you because you are a very mature person and you, and you already had so many experiences in the, in ministry that already taught you a lot that I know that there was nothing for me to do there, but I did try to come alongside from the very beginning and say, Hey, Carrie, let's just capture your vision. Like let's capture it on paper. Like I, I, I remember I have, a, so well. I, I have a document of us and you writing down, Hey, this is what I want to do. I, I remember asking you, what do you want the podcast to be remembered for when it's done? And I remember your answer. And it was, it was, it's a fantastic leadership library. Like anyone can come to this podcast. And you said, I also want to be known for having the conversations that we have backstage in, in the, in the open. So that for that was a litmus test for if I, if, if my in a conversations with guests aren't honest and real, then I don't want to have them. Yeah. Two, if, if if it doesn't turn into something that can become a library for leadership where I can cut to cherry pick based on my challenges, I don't want to do it. And and I feel like that's the goal. The goal is like, okay, now let's catch it before the audience shows up. Yeah. Because at some point, if you start to strafe this, I have a litmus to come back and say, this is what you said you wanted. Right. And so, so I think sometimes we have to capture down what is our what is our heart, what is our mission before that happens, um, and now that played itself out in a lot of ways. Like I said, I think some parts are great because you you created resources for those who were like you, which is I'm a mm. ministry leader. I know the challenges, so there was empathy that I that didn't have to be taught or or too reminded of. Uh, but there were a couple of junctures where we could have strayed and we didn't. I mean, I I remember you saying no to people wanting to advertise that was turning money down, mm-hmm. um, and and I remember a couple of opportunities where. You know, you just said, Kevin, that's not helpful enough. Like, I mean, I don't know how much you agonize. I mean, if everyone knew how much you agonize over the three takeaways on on podcast show notes, they would mm. be like, wow, Carrie really cares about me. Uh, you know, you care about the takeaways. I remember, the, I remember the tweets, Kevin, these tweets that we're selecting, not helpful enough. That's not helpful <laughs> enough. That, you know, and I'm like, and, you know, that's not, what they, right. that's not what that's not what leaders need. And so I think there's a little bit of that has to be baked into it of am I being helpful um, and what we're doing there. But I, I, there were things you, you made some decisions on along the way that showed me we were on track. And then what I tried to do on my end was just reiterate that a lot. So you knew that there was someone else on the team who felt the same way, thought the same way and was trying to make sure it got baked into what we did. Um, trying to be generous, trying to do the Starbucks giveaways. How do we make sure that generosity is what flows from this? Uh, Dave Ramsey taught me that a, a good brand is a generous brand. And I felt like that was something I always thought with you. Like, okay, let's just be generous. Let's try our best to be generous with with your insights and your experiences, but also with the money as it comes in to to give back to the community. And luckily, that's who you are naturally. So it wasn't. I don't think I was pushing you in a direction. Um, but for some of my clients, it's not as it, it's not as natural. And I get it. I mean, if you're if your mom or dad stressed straight A's with obsession. You know, even when you're 45 years old, this the the winning component of it, am I winning in the back of your mind can sometimes still be louder than, you know, is this right? You know, or do I feel mm. good about this? It can be, I just want to do well. And this is more than that. Uh, this is more than that. And I can, you know, I, people talk about Kanye West all the time. I use him as an example because he's been as authentic as one could be his entire career for better or for worse. Right. That's him. And that's, that's who he is. And so what that means for him is when he goes out in public, if he turns someone down for an autograph, I, I guarantee they're not saying, 
I can't believe you did it. They're saying, oh, that's so Kanye. Yeah. Right. And that's pretty crazy to say, but I think a lot of leaders, they're introverted. Mm -hmm. They're so great on stage and everyone thinks that, that you want to hang out with them when you're done. Carrie, we're all going out. We're going to watch the game on Sunday night. You want to come? You're mm -hmm. like, absolutely not. Leave me no, alone. I'm going to bed, actually. That's, that's my yeah. plan. Get, get me you. out of here. Exactly. You know, the, and so that's a big part of it for me. No, you know, that, that it, man, there is, there's such a wealth there. First of all, just to get that out of the way, I agree. Me, like this started to break my way when I was in my mid forties, you know, where there was a wider audience and a bigger audience and it was after I burned out. And if that had happened when I was in my twenties or thirties, I think it would have been a very different journey. And so I think God beat a lot of that stuff out of me early in, in my leadership. And you know, if you do it for long enough when nobody shows up, it prepares you for when people actually show up and it, it helps you figure out what, what you really are like and what you're not like. And then the second thing you said, and I'm glad you went there, like, man, so you think of bringing in a personal branding strategist or strategist like you, who's going to help me with, okay, well, how do you get this message out there? You're right. Those first, not, not only a few meetings, but months, you just listened. I mean, you had just come over from Ramsey. You had left Dave Ramsey's organization on great terms, came over, started working with me and a few other people. And you were like, I want to become a student of you. And I want to figure out what makes you tick. I want to figure out what message you have inside you. That's right. That you want to get out into the world. And when I look back on that, it's like you just had your, I still remember the first time you heard me speak, you sat in the back with a couple of your friends and you just took notes and you were a voracious student and you're like, okay, this is it. Rather than saying, hey man, I don't care what you're doing. I got this great thing that can gain you 10,000 Instagram followers tomorrow, right? That's Which right. I think often in the branding world, we think that that is what branding people do. But you started from a very, very different place. I try to because I really believe that if we scale what's worth in you, then when, you, when you're doing a South by Southwest, the people walk out of the room and then they go and connect with you online. They're like, oh, that's the guy I just encountered how mm -hmm. great there's continuity, there's consistency, and there's and there's trust built because of it. Yeah. Um, you know, Glassdoor, I don't know if people know what Glassdoor is, I but do, Glassdoor, yeah. it's quite the Glassdoor website. is an online service where where employees, both current and former, can rate and review a company. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, if your Glassdoor can tell a story about what's really happening. Now, yes, people might leave a review, might be disgruntled. Yeah, but just because they're saying it in a negative way does not mean there's some not any truth to what they're saying, right? And my job is, you know what? If you're tough on people and you're hard and you're and you're you know, and that and like Dave Ramsey, said, I tell him people that his love language, his love language is tough love, you know, hmm. and but that's who he really is. So when he's on the radio, right. when he's getting hard on somebody, like, that's how he was with me and anybody else in a team meeting. It's tough love, and so he can scale that because who he actually is. Like that's who the that's who that guy is. He, he he's tough love, but he's like yeah, the uncle. And he'll be all over the credit card guy who's phoning in too, right? Like, that, what are right. you doing exactly. with those things? Rip it up, like tear exactly. It up. That's who he actually yeah. is. And so for him, he gets feel comfortable because I've scaled to the point of six million radio listeners weekly, who I actually am. So this is who I am. Take it or leave it. And I think that's a really big gift. Hmm. I, I, this, this is almost, I don't want it to become a therapy session, but for the young leaders listening, can you, can you get out there and get too big too soon? Like how, like oh, yeah. how does that happen? Well, I think absolutely. I think that's why I hope people, anyone listening saying anyone who calls himself an influencer online, that's just weird. That's just a weird thing because I'm an influencer. All, yeah. I'm an influencer. Yeah. Well, well, I'm an influencer. Well, who's not an influencer? Um, so the reality, I think that's a weird thing. So that means to me, you are, you have an audience and somehow, and it's due to fame or some kind of social light life. And that's weird. And it's weird because now you are famous for being with other people. You have influence because of some kind of status in society that has nothing to do with your character. And at that point you have to keep up appearances to be, to keep your job, which is tough. Um, but with that being said, for the young leader listening, I will say this one, embrace your evolution. Like, I mean, I, a matter of fact, that's how you're going to actually keep your audience is how vulnerable you are in your own evolution and development. You know, if, if I think about this with marriage, one of the things I learned early with my wife was I didn't want to read too many books that she wasn't reading too. 
Hmm. Because if the books are if the books are overly influencing my thinking, and, and her books are influencing her thinking, we can be on different wavelengths and never know it until like seven years when the books and their their methodology, oh. their thoughts have taken hold of our hearts. And we're like, how did you get here? How did I get here? I don't know. Well, I was reading this sci-fi book that changed my life and said that, you know, and I'm reading the other book about intentional living. And so it takes us down these weirdly weird paths. And so I think share what you're reading with your audience. Let them mm. grow with you. Embrace your own evolution, you know, and, and, and own that part of who you are and say, hey, I'm going to evolve. I'm going to change. This is a part of it. I, so I think that's that's a big win. The second thing I think is we need to get as much perspective on who we are as possible. That's yeah. why I advocate for personality assessments, especially for young people um, in their 20s and 30s. My, I'm, I'm only 34, so I'm, I'm speaking to my people when I say this, because we have to expedite our self-awareness because we mm. will we will because we don't necessarily know the needs behind the deeds yet. We haven't figured out that that one time that dad didn't give me a hug turned into this weird desire Just for like the I whole didn't world. get enough followers today. <laughs> Not enough people you like know? my picture. Yeah. But it happens. It happens it and does. we don't know it. And and so if you know it, you can monitor it. And so so that's a part of it. And also having a great community around you. Um, you know, you need people around you who will tell you take that post down. Um that you know you you did that for likes, you didn't do it for the right reasons. Um, you know, and, and so I, my, my wife is a very good at that with me. Um, I don't post a lot on social media. I'm working on that. But the reality I think is anything I'm doing in public in private, if it's, if, if she sees me doing it for the affirmation of others, she's quick to put me to say, that's not who you are. Don't do that. I had some, some guys of mine. I, I told a guy recently, a friend of mine, I said, Hey, you know what? I understand why clients want to take, take advantage of me. You know, I would do the same thing if I were in their shoes. He said, no, you wouldn't. That's not who you are. You would never do it to them. You would never ask for more than you're paying for. Matter of fact, you're likely to ask for less than you're paying for. And I said, you're right. That, I'm not, that's not who I am. I, I, why did I say that? Why, do, why did I feel like I had to justify someone's behavior? And so I think for many young leaders, we have to get clear on who we are and be okay with that. And then it's okay to broadcast our evolution. I think that is such a great insight, Kevin, this idea that if you're authentic, if you're real, not to use overused words, but you will change and you will grow with your audience. Like you think about Brene Brown, one yes. of the biggest names in leadership today. What is she known for? Like if, if Brene Brown ends up in a very different place five years from now, nobody will be shocked. That's right. That's or right. even me, me Oprah. You know, That's who's right. very who you've worked with, you know, very transparent about what's going on in her life, what's making her happy, what's not making her happy. You know, her journey with her weight. She's, she's been right. very public about that. And if you if you allow people to appropriately see the real you, you know, not in, hey, the, I just got back from my therapist and this is what we covered today. You might want to <laughs> just do that with your inner circle for a little while until you've digested it a bit. But, you know, this idea of, of not having, and even, you know, you think about that um, on social too with face filters and I got to retouch this and I got to make myself look a certain way. Why don't you be you? You know, that'd be great. Why do you, why do you not post on social personally? Well, much? I'm working on it. I, I think for me, uh, I've always been a person who thinks a lot about the future and mm -hmm. always thinking about, and so for me, trying to think I'm in the present, trying to be as present as I can be. And I know sometimes the people who do it very well on social media, they are, they're people who are aware that there's actually an audience that they serve as well. So think about how they bring the audience with them into their, in their moments. And I really do respect that. I mean, John does a fantastic job of this. John keeps, you know, a note of just random ideas, random thoughts. He, he recognizes that there's a community that connects with him, that he's also bringing them into these environments with him. And he's thoughtful about keeping them in, in, engaged in appropriately, in appropriate ways. Um, I forget they're there. I'm thinking, you know what? I'm here with Carrie and that's all that matters. So I actually had to change my process. I had to hire somebody. I, I've hired a full-time media producer who actually follows me around with video stuff and photos. And, and she works with me and started in January because I know I don't think about it. I'm trying to be as fully engaged in the moment as I can be. My clients ask that of me. And I want to make sure things get captured. I want to share and help people who aren't in the room. And so I'm now paying someone to think about that for me. And that's oh, okay wow. too. You know, you have to do what you have to do to, to, to get the progress you need to get in that area because I do value the ability. I mean, I follow people who influence me every day and I, and I want to have that opportunity to do that with other people. 
it, for me, it was an investment though. Oh, isn't that interesting? So how do you make a personal brand that's about you without making it about you? This is the question I love answering. And I, I know this wasn't on the list, so I'm excited we're going here. When I first started working with Orange, the number one question I got from every ministry leader and pastor was, I don't want a platform because it's not about me. It's about God. I don't want a platform. I don't want a platform. And the reality is people trust people. So mm. get over it because people trust people. Who? How do I know about God? Oh, someone told me about him. Mm. The, you know, the Bible is pretty clear about faith comes from hearing. And so there's a reality. Someone said something to me. They introduced me to this, to this, to this opportunity to receive love and connect, you know, from with, you know, with the King of Kings. So let's start there. The second thing is you build a platform. It's not about you by intentionally saying, okay, what are the core tenets of my message? What are the principles that go beyond who, who, who I am and what I'm, and, and, and what, what I personally have to say. And, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to bake in things that allow me to lift up others. Mm. When you're, when you're, when your platform is done, you should be a platform where you're standing on the bottom, holding up millions of people, not a platform where you're standing up on a stage. The platform you're building is one where you become a pillar for people to to climb on top of you and get a, and get a leg up because of what the platform you created, not for you to stand on the stage. So it's a reverse pyramid, an inverse pyramid, more, more than it is a stage you're building for the for the for everyone else. So with Carrie as an example, because we all obviously know his story, the podcast being interview driven was key. Mm. You could have easily shared some of your thoughts audibly. You speak, it probably would have drove speaking engagements more quickly. Actually, people just heard you. With with, with you had you know Kevin's going to be my host, and I'm going to be the thought the thought leader here. And, right. and and by the way, you had plenty to share. Your blog was already proving you had insight to give. But by making it about everyone else's stories, the growth of the platform meant every week a new leader, whether you know of them or do you do not know about them, is being lifted. Their that was a very lifted. intentional decision. That, that I, it was. You I were, remember you felt that. No, way. I remember we talked about it because most people were saying, "Well, just share. You know, maybe do a podcast version of what you're writing, or you know." And I, I just thought I'm having these fascinating conversations. I wish everybody could hear, and I, I want to get them out there. And I don't know, I'll run this by you, but to me, there's, there's two heroes in every episode. Number one, I want to make sure that the guest gets their message out. Yeah. So that's showing a little restraint, making sure that I give you plenty of opportunity to get out of you what is in you. But then secondly, I want to do it through the lens of, is this going to be helpful to the leaders who are listening? Like, I know you're in the real world, you got real problems, you're on your run, you're you know on your commute, you're cooking dinner, you're in the backyard listening to this thing at 1.5x. But <laughs> even though it's free to you, I I want you to say, I learned something today. This helped me solve a problem. This made me a better person. This made me a better dad, husband, Christ follower. It made me a better entrepreneur. It gave me courage. Like every episode will have a slightly different goal, but I want it to be helpful. Is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Absolutely. I think there's a... if. What do you want the platform, the message to to do for people after you're done, when you're dead, like you're yeah. gone? Google yeah. is Google and YouTube are now how people discover you and you are not there. What do you want? Well, if that's the case, then we need to build that in. But I think we have a chance to build things in in a way that elevate everyone else. And I think you can be strategic and systematic. Um, about how you do that. I mean, Dave Ramsey's been strategic, bringing on other authors and speakers who can succeed him whenever he decides to stop. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, obviously you've done it through your podcast. It, it is, you can do the social media. I don't want to complicate this. I just want to say, how intentional are you being about what you're trying to say? And can you intentionally find a way to lift others up um, in your process and, and and build in some mechanism that happens to do that on a regular basis and over time you'll look up and some people still feel it's about you but that's because i'm choosing you as my guide mm. the, you know carrie newhoff.com has to be about carrie to a certain extent because he's really selling himself to all of us as a guide and say is carrie equipped does he have the experiences does he have the empathy does he does he does he even care about people like me enough to know and say he's qualified to be my guide he's qualified 
What's changing in marketing as we speak? How is the ground shifting? What's new? What's different? Okay, so I'm going to let everybody in on what's going to hit you probably in seven years. Okay. Um, so so I'm being very transparent. It's accessible to you as a leader to, to implement these tools now, but most of you won't feel any pressure to do it for about seven years. All right. And so one is marketing automation. You say, oh, Kevin's been going for a while. Yeah, but still, how much of what you do is a team member logging into your email system, typing up that week's email and pressing send? All right. And so, so everything is becoming automated in marketing. And so you can do you can automate across multiple channels, automate a text message, an email. You know, you can now dynamically change your website's content. So once I join Carrie's newsletter, and I put in my information, it, it puts a tracker on my computer, not as creepy as it sounds. And, and then I get there, it says, hey, Kevin, welcome back, right? We are now in an era where personalization and customization are incredibly important. The so longer, you personalize and customize while you automate? Is that it? You do both. You do wow. both. And so so one big tool that's coming up is like a chat bot. That's a big, big thing's coming on mm-hmm. where when you hit someone's website, uh, instead of it being saying, hey, go to this form, you say, talk to our chat bot. Right. You know, talk to talk to Leaderbot on Carrie's website. And Leaderbot says, No, we hey. actually have that. When we do courses, we have a chat bot. Right. So Leaderbot says, hey. it's a handoff hey. between uh, AI and then a real person who, if AI can't answer the question, a real person jumps in. Per, is that right. what you're talking about? I am. And the reality, though, is most people can do that on the, on your content sites, right? Hey, really? what brought how? you here? Tell what, me how. This is new what, to me. So I come to carrynewoff.com and it says, well, what brought you here today? What, what leadership challenge are you facing? You might give me a couple of prompts, look for a couple of keywords, you know, maybe are you struggling to get sleep, right? And you program right. the bot oh. to start to get me to the blog post that I need most, right? Because at the end of the day, your job, like Google, is to get me to, to the thing that's most helpful the fastest, Ah, okay. And all that's automating quickly. You can, you can, um, it's, it's becoming faster and faster because of the reality is the data we're able to gather on people over time through relationship, through Facebook, social media, obviously our website traffic, et cetera. We have the ability to serve them at a breakneck speed and people now value immediacy, personalization, contextualization more than free. They'll pay for this. If you, if, I mean, they'll pay for this period because that's what people are paying for right now. There's, there's always going to be a free option, but everyone's paying more money for contextualization, immediacy, customization. And so the, so as Tony Robbins always told us, the person who gets paid the most money is the person who solves problems the best, the fastest. Hmm. And so I will pay. I, yes, I could put per- peppermint essential oils in my forehead when I have headaches, but be patient. <laughs> Or I can take ibuprofen and I'm I'm be good in 15 minutes. You're, and you're so, gonna buy that ibuprofen. It is what it is. And so I think there's a reality of us as leaders saying, how do we automate this? Now, for the church in particular, this is really critical because of online church. You have a person who might be watching your sermon at midnight. And what's there to greet them? Nothing. And no. if something is if something is there to greet them, it's actually all the cool sermon titles that are catchy. But they're in chronological order. But how about this? What would happen? And I'm, I'm saying this to everybody out here. What would happen if I got to your site, if it said, Kevin, what are the three things or what thing, what area of life are you most looking for God to move in in the next 12 months in your life? Mm-hmm. And it was your health, your finances, your marriage, your parenting, your career, your connection with him, et cetera. I clicked that button and you shoot me to a page that has that content. Because what happens is your content is all organized by the month of the year. I'm not a Christian. Maybe I am a Christian. And, it's, and last week's sermon was called, you know, uh, never give up. And I'm like, what's that about? Or maybe the yeah, sermon yeah, was nobody called. Nobody knows. No one knows. Or maybe the sermon was called, um, you know, um, you know, back to life or back or back from no, back to the future. Some cool, catchy you know, movie, right. back, movie reference. Well, what happens, though, is I don't know what it's about. But what would happen if when it goes online, it's retitled? See, for the church, Ooh. it's called Back to the Future. They, they love the cool title. They're the congregation. They want the interesting, catchy titles. Yeah, yeah. But for my, for my friend, they want to know, 
It's called how, when, why, how, why Christ resurrected and how the resurrection of Christ changed your life. Mm-hmm. Or, may, or maybe it's something even more direct, and it's the foundation of, Christi- of the Christian faith, right? Yeah. Because the, re- the reality is on Google every day, someone's searching what's the meaning of life. You can, actually, you can actually search this up and look it up because Google has, you know, they make sure this public. Mm-hmm. How many times per day someone searches what's the meaning of life? And the reality is this. They're going to Google. And so I want to make sure how, how can a church website be organized topically? Because when I search about leadership, even if your church had a blog, Carrie, you'd come up before the church. Yeah. Because of how you've written what you've written. You've written it for discovery. You've written it in a way that the keywords are designed to be found. The Mm -hmm. church is not doing that. And so the reality is who is going to show up when someone searches what's the meaning of life is a random blogger, not a church. You're right. No, that's exactly it. And you know how I find my content now because I'm 600 posts into my blog or whatever? I Google it. It's like I Google my name and the subject because it's way easier than navigating my blog because I can't find stuff. There's too much there. And a chat bot, as one example, could be Great idea. A, a, a welcome committee and says, hey. And that, 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 that technology is available like as of right now? As of right now. It's already Who's available and it's, it? a, and it's affordable. I mean, I mean, obviously there's a lot of people in the B2B and the B2C, especially yeah. B2B marketing world, so business to business, they're already there mm-hmm. because they have to compete. It's, it's really competitive in that space. And so, and so there are no churches using it. I've not found one church using this yet. So, so I'm, so I'm trying to give away secret sauce in, in advance because you don't have to do it today, right? But there are great churches out there. There are great um, companies out there that are helping churches do some of this. I'm, I met a guy recently where, you know, hey, we want to help people set up appointments to come by our church and be a new visitor. And we'll take them on a welcome experience. Okay, maybe it's what you want to have your, your, your bot do is help people schedule first time visits. Maybe you want to get them to the sermon that's going to be the most helpful for them. Maybe you want to... Offer them a, pr- a talk to someone who can pray for them. Like you yeah, yeah. do with it what you want. Use your imagination. But the reality is, everyone's not on your site be- on Sunday between nine a.m. and one. And the other thing is this: Do you have a button on your church during live services that says, "We just someone to pray for you"? Is there a button where someone can just mm. click a button and they calls a or number? Or do you have to or- go to blank church slash? event slash prayer team slash pray now, which nobody will ever find in a million years. Exactly. So the reality is for all of us is saying that's what technology can enable. But I think automation is key because I could technically say, all right, hey, Kevin came to our page and told us that the thing he wants to know or wants the most help with right now in his life is his health. And he wants to know what God has to say about his health. So once that happens, Hide everything else. Like, make it go away. Put me on an email sequence where I get automated emails from the church once a week for the next 12 weeks about nothing but what God has said about health. It might be, here's a sermon that came out three years ago. You should check this message yeah. out. Here's, here's, an, here's, here's, a, here's a, you know, an article that we found we think is really helpful. I mean, you just be a resource because that's how you build trust. The church is trying to position themselves in the lives of those who come or in the community of saying, we are a guide. Well, a guide to what? A guide to Christ. Yeah. And Kevin, so, that's I, so, good. so I think it's a big deal. It's a big deal. Yeah. And we've talked about this on this podcast before in different episodes, but nobody is better at producing content that is immediately forgotten and never <laughs> referred to again than the church, right? Yeah, like for sure. we do that. And I mean, it's really hard. Sometimes you do something that's really great that you pour dozens of hours into. And that's true of any content creator. That's true for podcasters who are listening, right. writers who are listening. And and a lot of us, and we talked about personality type at the beginning, but people ask me, what's your favorite message? What's your favorite book? The answer is the next one. Because we're like that. We're <laughs> wired that way, right? It's like, yeah, oh, what I did last year, insignificant. Well, no, it helped a lot of people then. It could help a lot of people in the future. But we don't think that way. Indeed. The other thing I just want to point out there is technology that's once again been out for a long time, but churches are not using it, but eventually we'll be forced to. And that is a membership site. 
Like, and, and they say, well, Kevin, no, we have membership sites. They can go in and manage their giving. No, 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 no. I'm talking about a content membership site, like the one you would subscribe to if you wanted to join, you know, some leadership program behind the scenes and you get all this content. So Why it's like nineteen ninety nine a month and you're in the membership site or how does that work? Or is it it's free? free. It's okay. completely free, right? But here's what it does for the church. It actually lets them connect the needs, the content consumption with an individual because now there's a username and a password. They can log and say, Kevin has watched a lot of com- a lot of sermons recently because there's a lot of content about marriage. I wonder what that means is going on at home with him and Leah. <laughs> we should we should probably just be prompted business behavior to actually give him a call and check on him before he shows up and says, we're about to get a divorce. Can you solve this for us? Mm-hmm. But right now it's all anonymous. Uh, and you say, well, Kevin, what does it matter? Well, we can customize it. We can customize the experience. We can say to them, you are seen. And in a world with online church, I don't know if we have an option, but guess who does that really well? Every business you go on a website of. Yeah, yeah, because you're looking for shoes. The next thing you're on Instagram and there they are. A- Amazon. You're logged into Amazon. You don't log out. You get back in. Everything you look at, they're saying, Hey, hey guys, take some notes on Carrie. Take some notes on Kevin. Mm-hmm. Make some notes on Kevin. Make some notes on Carrie. So that when we log in, we're like, I feel so known here. They know exactly right. what I like. Well, the church can't say that. What the it's heck? It's like your Netflix algorithm because you're, you're right. Some people are going to push back and go, Kevin, that is so creepy. It violates my privacy. I'm going to go live on a mountain and unplug, right? Off the grid. But everybody else is doing it. And you're saying, well, why not do it for good? Not just for money. Because in reality, here's a challenge. Here's a challenge for all the leaders listening, for both entrepreneurs and church leaders, pastors, etc. This is the experience that everyone in society is now accustomed to and expecting, and that's why I said it's coming. It's coming because the consumer in you that you cannot separate from the believer in you already expects someone to treat you like they know you when they meet you. <laughs> oh, how dare they send me this message? I've been going to church for fifteen years, five years, and they didn't know I. Oh, so you expect me to know this about you? Well, people leave church over that. They're like, I was sick. I was in the hospital for a month. Nobody knew. Nobody came to visit me. Nobody called. I'm gone. And you're saying, now, listen, I have a lot of empathy for that because you can't know everybody goes to your church and sometimes pastors just miss it. But you're saying artificial intelligence and technology can help you fill in those gaps. And absolutely. And the reality is I don't know if we're going to have a choice as we move forward. This is inevitable. It's it's inevitable. And my, I, have a, I have a lot of passion, obviously, for, for pastors. My grandfather was a pastor, and so I have a, I have a, I have a, I have a place in my heart for them. And as I'm listening, even talking out loud, it's, it's, it's a reality that people can cherry pick their pastor. Hmm. I can cherry pick my te- I can cherry pick my teaching. I get online right now, and I have Stephen Furtick, Kerry Newoff, Andy Stanley, TD Jakes, and my and my iPod, and I can cherry pick preaching. So for every pastor who feels like their preaching is their unique ability, and that's the one thing they do better than anyone in the whole wide world, I'm not calling you a liar. What I am saying is you have a lot of competition in that regard. <laughs> yeah. If your church is going to rely, if you say, well, we have the, I heard someone tell me recently. Well, Kevin, we have Bible teaching here. We teach the Bible here. And I'm like, hey, I'm not saying you don't. What I am saying is that's just, if if that is the only distinguishing factor, that means my needs will always go unmet. You're putting a lot of pressure on the Holy Spirit to tell you what what message to preach this week because you're relying solely on the Holy Spirit to guide you to what Kevin needs right now. When I could tell you, I could just raise my hand and say, hey, I want this. I need this. You tell me and you go about your business and you can design a unique experience through your marketing and your websites that truly allow you to meet people with that point of need. That's why Google's winning. A search engine is someone putting in a need and then someone answering the need with as much precision as possible. That's how we win. And I think for every leader, that's why you have to build a personal platform Mm -hmm. because someone wants to trust the person leading it before they trust the organization. It's not about you, but you are the leader. And at some point, I'm going to evaluate my ability to trust the organization, not God necessarily, but this organization based on who is at the helm. 
Isn't that fascinating? You know, because as, as you're sharing all this, I'm thinking about even, I have a couple of Alexas in the house and it blo- I'm sure I'm, you know, I've got 10% of its capacity activated, maybe 1%, but it's like, you know, Alexa, what's traffic like between here and Detroit? And like within a second, I'm like, it's uh, four hours and 12 minutes with a little bit of buildup in the Toronto area if you take route X and route Y. I'm like, really? How do you know that so fast? And nobody, the days of like scrolling through all the O's in Google, you know, to find <laughs> on page number 10, there's the piece. Nobody, nobody makes it to page two anymore. It's like, I don't make it to link five. One. I don't, make it to link five, I don't make it to link five on page one. No, I, I don't either. I'm like, yeah. I just trust whatever is number one. I'm just going to go there and that's the authority, which is not always wise, but it's true. Nope. Yeah. Anything else that's like uh, coming down the pike that we need to be aware of? Uh, this is so helpful. Gosh. Well, 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 I think the key thing with, um, so, so they call the chat bot stuff like conversational marketing, this thing okay. of like, can I connect? So, so that's one thing you want to study. But I know I said, I said a moment ago, but dynamic web experiences. The okay. fact that you can scale what someone encounters on the web person to person. That's I think that's I think that's absolutely important. So personalization is the future. Personalization is the future. Mass customization is what they talk to call it, right? This idea of customizing at scale is possible. And I think you can get you can get a lot of that there. The other part I think if, for a lot of people is just we and I'm going. It's very simple. We're just trying to get enough insights to treat different people differently, hmm. right? No one and yep. no one is surprised when I say that. Oh, of course, right? Yeah, just just. But are you prepared to treat different people differently? And if you're not, you have to start the process of doing that. And un, and technology enables that. So that's whether that's through online content that's covering a variety of topics. Then how's it indexed through Google for search engines? Then you obviously conversation marketing through chat bots. And then they're calling that personalization through websites, dynamic websites. Um, that's those are gonna be huge for everyone coming up soon. And how will you keep that information and store it in some kind of system where you get to know and learn your members over time, your customers over time is really key. Well, I've been, you know, I've been thinking about that from time to time. Like even, you know, most people who listen to this podcast right now, you and me, Kevin, we both have Instagram, we have Facebook, we have Twitter, uh, we have Netflix, like just name some big ones. We're on Amazon, we have Amazon Prime. Okay, so there's five big ones. But the reality is we think we're on the same platform, but we're mm. not because my Instagram looks completely different than your Instagram. And your Facebook feed looks totally different than my Facebook feed. And your Netflix, if I go sit in your family room and turn on your Netflix or sit on your tablet and look at your Netflix, it looks totally different than mine because the algorithms have moved it into different places and our individual choices have made it completely different. And I think we still have in, you know, the church space and the business space, this idea that one size fits all when it doesn't. So what would you say, because I get it, you're a church of over a thousand or a a business that's into the seven figures and you're like, okay, well, I'll get that chat bot or I'll I'll do this or I'll do that or I'll hire a programmer or we'll create a staffing position. But what would you say for the startup? What would you say for the solopreneur or the, the small church pastor or the church planter who's like, dude, you have no idea how small our budget is. Like, are we just out to lunch on this? How, how, does, how does that happen for smaller organizations? Well, first, for, yeah, for, great question. The first thing is the tools are getting cheaper. Okay. So when, so when I'm talking about a, you know, HubSpot for, you know, H-U-B-S-P-O-T creates a free CRM system. We could, tr- you could put information in because it's not built for churches. Well, for, it's built for businesses. Um, well, you know, MailChimp, an email marketing system that offers automated email sequences is free up to 2000 users, 2000 people yeah. in, your, in your email list. Um, so first of all, I would just check to say, is it really a money thing? Because there's a lot of free tools out there. Mm-hmm. I want to put that out there first. The second thing I would say is start with empathy. You know, most churches, the challenge I see now when it comes to communications, even on a small level is you think this matters to everyone and you think the only way to get it out there is spray and pray. 
I'm just, you know, you know, you kind of have this hose, you kind of just like turn around in a circle, just spraying everybody, like, know about this event. But if you're honest, who is the event created for? Who is going to really come? Who is this ministering to their, in, in, a, in a very personal way? Oh, it's just 15 people in the church. Well, I mean, if you're okay with 15 people attending, then that's okay. Personally invite mm-hmm. the 15 and move on. But I think what I, what I think the reality I would say is segmentation is yes. what I would say to them. And so you have to decide in advance what your what the message you're speaking about, not necessarily from the pulpit, but like the message of that event, the message of that initiative, who are you trying to reach within your congregation and outside of it? Target those individuals. So for example, my wife, uh, when our school wants to, my daughter's preschool wants to reach my wife, email is secondary to an app that sends a notification straight from the teachers. Hmm. And so their goal is saying, we're just trying to find the most accurate and effective way to reach Mrs. Jennings. That's it. Like everything mm-hmm. else really doesn't matter. And so so if you are a church who still has a bulletin, I am not anti-bulletin. If your congregation reads bulletins, you keep bulletins. If they do not read bulletins, save the money tomorrow. <laughs> and that's the thing. It's, it's, we're holding on to it because one, two will ask for it, not because it's actually effective. And so who are you trying to reach? What do they, what are, what do they, what do they read? What do they check? And, and if that's the case, change to reach them. So you can do less and still be more effective because you've chosen the two or three approaches that you can actually do. Now you might say, Kevin, we don't have anyone who knows how to do that. Where do we find them? Now, I would say there's sites like Fiverr, and that's uh, F-I-V-E-R-R. There's uh, Upwork, U-P-W-O-R-K. There are tools we can find, people who can just do that thing for you at an affordable rate so you can get it done. Okay, we have no money. Okay, now you're talking about, can there, is there a volunteer we can find that can be trained to do mm-hmm. it? So we'll be patient with you. We'll even pay for the training. And when it's done, we'll write a recommendation letter. You can add to your resume. Like, we will help you get this new skill for your job. Oh, that's fantastic, too. And so I think the resourcefulness will be key, but we have to start with empathy. When you know where you can reach people you're trying to communicate with, you do it differently. If Carrie wants to reach me quickly and I want to reach Carrie, we go straight to text. Yeah. Because Carrie, because Carrie knows me and I know Carrie. So relationship predicates that ability to empathize. No, and I think I think you use a really good example with the preschool, right? For your daughter, the last thing Leah, your wife, wants to do is like sort through. Well, in seventh grade today, in fifth grade today, in third grade, no, no, no. I I want to know about my daughter. Like you just, that's it. Would you please not spam me? I want to know about my daughter. And one day when she's in kindergarten, we will talk about kindergarten. And in first grade, we'll do first grade. Yeah, it's, we we almost we rarely get a communication that's not relevant to us. Right, and if it's an all school thing, like the school will be closed. Well, that is still relevant to preschoolers. Indeed, yes, sir, it yeah. is. No, and it's so funny because I think you're right. We expect it in every other area of our life, but when it comes to a startup or a church or that kind of thing, we're like, no, we'll just broadcast and hope it reaches everybody. You've been thinking a lot. Anything else on marketing? Because I, I want to shift gears to focus, but I want to make sure that we. Uh, have um, exhausted that. Well, we'll no, I, exhausted. yeah, no, yeah. You, are, well, no, I feel great about that. Now, I mean, I was, I'll close with some things about personal branding, but let's let's jump on. Let's let's pivot. Okay. Well, while we're doing branding, go, go ahead, go ahead on personal branding, or you want to leave, leave till the end. <laughs> well, no, I, I'll talk about it now. I, I think oh, the yeah, reality, yeah. yeah, I think the reality then is, I, I want you to understand that a strategy for as a leader, especially a pastor, for building a personal brand where it does not compete with the church is one, you tell the stories of the people. You let the church tell the stories of all the events and happenings, uh-huh. right? And 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 so so that's one opportunity. Say, so how well am I telling the stories of my team? Especially that, because, you know, the, the church is going to want to highlight the people who got baptized. And that's great. Mm-hmm. It really is. I, I mean, it's amazing. You as a leader can say, let me lift up all these fantastic people who serve here every week through my personal social media accounts so that you start to see that there are people who think about you when you're not here. That there's that there are people who work for it, work on your behalf to create what you create. And that's a branding technique that's gone on for a long time. It's the reason why they tell you that your eggs are cage your eggs are cage-free, grass-fed, because they want you to feel and believe that there was extra 
benefits and care given to the product you're about to consume that make it superior to others. And so when you don't tell that story of the late night meeting from the team, the volunteers cutting out whatever for decorations, you actually make me think it just magically happens. Mm -hmm. Those stories actually add value. And you can tell those stories. Another now you should you do, do that as a person, like as a church leader, or have the organization do it. Well, I think it's valuable to do as a pastor, and ah. a lead, in a church. You can you can find balance, but I think that as a as a leader, you can do that and just and you're celebrating all who are, who are doing great work. But we also know it gets rewarded, it gets repeated. So there's a lot of people now volunteers who want to do a great job of that. The second thing is I've noticed with my other podcast I'm a part of with Launch University. We, get, we all get stopped about our own teams listening to the podcast. Why? Because they get to hear what the CEO's thinking. They get to hear what their leader's thinking. They get to hear. And so when you share your thoughts on social media, your team gets a pulse on your inner thoughts mm -hmm. at scale. So now you don't have to wait till staff meeting to say, hey, I read a great book. You should all read it. The whole team sees you're reading this book. You're quoting it in social media. You're benefiting from it. And now they either get to benefit from what you're learning or they also understand where your wavelength's at. And that's a powerful thing from, from a leadership perspective as well. And then the last thing that's really big is you get to have the community evolve with you. So once again, sort of this earlier with my wife and I, that book reading example. But imagine if Kerry shares just a little bit of the things he's reading on social media. Well, it might turn into a sermon six months from now, eight months from now. What he's actually done, though, he's actually primed our hearts to hear a message about that. Yeah. And so the organization can can be can lag and that's OK if it lags. But we as a community, we through the podcast, we can hear when Carrie's thinking about sleep and things about these through his blog and through his, through his podcast. So we're not surprised when it shows up and didn't see it coming. You yeah, primed our hearts for that message. And it amazes me sharing what I share mostly on Insta stories these days. But, you know, my fascination with barbecue, going for a bike ride, people are like, even at our church, they're like, oh, you were out on the roads this week. That's awesome. Was that you that I passed? You know, uh, and and that kind of personal connection goes a long way. It's kind of, I always think it's what used to happen at grade school where mm -hmm. it's like, what'd you have for dinner last night? Macaroni. What did you have for dinner last night? You know. And, 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 and you've also demonstrated the principles because Carrie can tell us how to be high impact leaders, but we all saw him work out this morning or right. yesterday in the snow on a bike, right? Mm -hmm. So he's, he's showing us there's actually action that has to take place. This is how you create the rhythm. This is what you actually do. This, hey, I start my meal on the big green egg in the morning. I leave, go run my activity for the day. I come, you know, you're, you're giving us, you're giving us color into the principles. Cause we can say, oh, of course, Carrie can do that. His church is doing this. He already has this business. This is going like this. Well, now it's, Oh, I see how it happens. Yeah, I yeah, you're rhythm. taking them behind the scenes. I, I, and that kind of, that, and that allows people to actually learn at a deeper level from what you're doing. Well, that's and like so, uh, our mutual friend, John Acuff, is taking us into the writing of a book. And this is indeed. how I prep for a speech and that kind of stuff, which I, I, you know, is just brilliant. John does such a great job of that. And so I just encourage leaders to think, separate of just what the platform means for your influence outside of the church, Think about what it does for you within the context of your church, for the people you serve, for the people you lead, and for those who watch online, especially, once again, those who will never get a chance to run into you at a grocery store who follow what your church is doing to be able to put heart and, and, and other things behind what they experience on your ministry online or on a Sunday and say, wow, this man or this woman, this is how they try to live that out. Um, in their daily life. And so I think it's a big deal to do that. And so I just encourage you, to, it, it has immediate benefits in your leadership. And yes, it eventually will allow you to scale your influence as well. How do you know if you've crossed a line where it's all about you? Well, this is, I promised in the last podcast, I can't remember right now, but first I was given something by a gentleman named Van Beard, who I just love. And it's called the 60 20, 20 rule. If I brought this up before, I apologize. No, I don't, I don't um, recall. But, I know Van, but. Yeah. So it's called the 60 20, 20 rule. It's something he, he kind of refined based on Gary Vee's models of things and, and philosophies. But Van calls it the relational equity model. And that means 60% of your posts are about other people, mm -hmm. causes, 
places, 20% are behind the scenes a day in the life. So people get to know who you are personally. Then only 20% of your posts can be about pitching, pushing people to do something you want them to do, whether it be read your book, go to the church, come to an event. And you have that litmus test. But what that means for you is the more you want to talk about yourself, you have to talk about others at a higher, at a higher clip. Oh, wow. and, 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 it's, and it's a guardrail. So that's one thing just as, a, as an actual action step. But, to, and I'm, but I'm being very transparent. Um, the number one challenge I see from people who actually end up turning it all about them is everyone who's around them is on the payroll. Mm. I mean, and that, that's the, now that's the, that's the, like the bigger piece. Like it's so social media is a, a, a kind of a symptom piece, like kind of a, a manifestation of what's already happening in the heart. If everyone around you works for you, you're in trouble because, because you're putting yourself in a situation as a leader where me challenging Carrie means my kids may not eat if he fires me. Right. And at some point in my mind, I can convince myself, not saying it's always true. I can convince myself that it's a him or me situation. Mm -hmm. And if it's between me checking Carrie and losing influence and getting fired or me taking care of my kids, I'm going to be quiet. And so, so I think it's really important for you to have some advisors who aren't on the payroll. They can be your what do buddies. You mean by advisors, you mean like a board or I mean, it mean can be friends? a board. It can be board. It can be a friend. Like that's the thing I think is important for you to find. Right. I mean, so I'll say it can be a board and then you have a personal advisory board. So Carrie has that in place. Do. Um, yeah. It can be a couple of key friends you check in with. It could be someone who you actually Say to your one of your friends, hey, here's one of the things. Every time I make, you know, get really on this kick about talking about myself too much, if if I go through 20 posts on social media about me, you get I pay you five dollars. <laughs> it goes into a, it goes into a jar. Like I mean, you know, but you just have to make mechanisms to say I have someone who's helping me police, someone who's more incentivized to see me be healthy than they are to see me win with my influence, because I think. And I think the leaders who I've seen who have healthy support systems, it's much easier to bring that back to a safe place. For those that don't, we're in trouble. Um, the other thing I would say is, once again, what can you do within the context of how you share your influence and grow it that naturally will force you to serve someone else? Now you might say, what do you mean, Kevin? All my ideas are brilliant. They're designed to help everybody. No, no, no. I'm saying, I hear you. What I'm saying is, how are you giving your influence away? Like how, how, like Carrie has me on the podcast right now. I have, you know, you could argue that I'm worthy or not of this opportunity, but the reality is he, he spends a significant portion of his influence capital for, for lack of a better phrase, giving it away. By letting other people come on this pla on this podcast, promote their books, promote themselves, share their stories, introduce their church, talk about their ministry experiences. And that's what am I doing to give my influence away? God did not give me influence for me. Mm. And if and if that's not a part of the rhythm of what you do, and I say I'm not talking about a special project, the rhythm. Every week I give influence away in this unique, simple way. If mm. you're not doing that in a if you're not doing that, I believe you're personally in trouble. And and so that's that's something I think a lot about. Um, tell people, gauge that. That's so good. That's so good, Kevin. Okay, before we go, focus. You've been thinking a lot about focus lately. Tell me, tell me what's behind that. I read a book by Seth Godin uh, 10 mm. years ago so, called The Dip. Yeah. And I reread it about a month ago. Uh, the recommendation of, of uh, our mutual friend, Mr. Brian Miles. Oh, yeah. And the opening of the whole book, he says, Vince Lombardi told us that winners never quit and quitters never win. And that's complete garbage. And I think it's true. Strategic quitters win every day. Strategic quitters. Kerry Newhoff, I'm, I use an example because we all know you, so please, I'm not trying to pick on you, but I think you understand. You're one of your best books before didn't see it coming was a book called parenting beyond your capacity. Yeah. Yeah. The market told you, we love you as a parenting guy. Keep talking about it. Go Carrie, mm -hmm. go parenting. We will, you just talk about parenting. We will buy it, man. You just go, you just talk about it. And you said, that's not, that's not what I feel. And what's real for me at this point, I quit. 
Not stop, not fail. I flat out stopped. I'm just out of the game, not doing it anymore. That book don't sold over 100,000 copies. I'm like, yeah, I don't speak on it anymore. It's funny. Yeah. That's called strategic quitting. We hmm. understand this concept well because we understand the value of pruning a bush and allowing other limbs to get the nutrients it needs to flourish at a higher level. Every branch we cut's not dead. Some of them, <laughs> some of them just are taking energy from the, from the vines and the things we need to grow the fastest and we have to let something go. And so for me, this has been very big because most of what I, I got to where I am in my career by saying yes, a lot, hmm. a lot of yes, yes, yes. And, and, um, and many are like that. We hustle our way to this moment, right? I was willing to do what it took. I work all night. I work all weekend. I would take on five projects. I would go learn a new skill. And then you have kids or something happens in your life where you recognize your capacity can no longer be stretched by just working longer hours. Mm. There's a permanent reduction in your time. And the answer is, now has to be no. But guess who but guess who found that out earlier? Who? Everybody we look up to in society. Beyonce was a, a, a full-time singer at 16 years old already on television. LeBron James was practicing in basketball full-time at 12 to be in the NBA by 18 years old. Like find anyone you admire in society, they locked in on their thing as soon as they found it and they cut everything else off. Yeah, they're not hanging out till 3 a.m. Friday night partying with friends. They're like, I want to be on TV when I'm 16, right? Exactly. And, and things, exactly. And I'm not saying even no social life. But what I am saying is you're the one who's pushing off, pushing four initiatives forward at one time. Why don't you just do one? Mm-hmm. See, unfortunately, like there is a cost. And I think for me in particular, I'm guilty. Like, I'm, I mean, I've always followed a lot of my interest to develop myself and learn new things. And the reality is I'm the one inviting the distractions, preventing me from having an impact at a higher level. Wow. So what are you focusing on right now? Well, there's a couple of things. I mean, I think one, I'm, I'm really locked in on being a better husband and a better dad. I, I think, and, I, and once again, I think for leaders who are listening, it's easy to play where the scoreboard's clear, right? Oh yeah, put a point <laughs> on the board. Send, you know, send me where the score. Send me where the score is clear, and and I and I'm, I'm working really hard on that. And and I have to really thank our friend Brian Miles, who's mentoring me right now. He's helped me. He's helped me create a way to create a scoreboard out of that. Mm-hmm. And I and I and so and so that's been that's been huge for me. Um, and I reckon I've not been intentional in that area. I've been drifting towards success not designing a way to success. Hmm. And I think that, and so I think it's very important. And Michael talks about that, the idea of drifting, designing, or driving. And the problem is we're just driven. We're so driven that we're not designing intentionally. So we get to, as you say, Carrie, we get to a place we don't even want to be by being driven blindly, but we're not designing with intentionality. Um, So that's a big deal. Um, So that's one thing. The other thing is in my business, I've had to own where I add value. I love marketing only because I love the opportunity for someone to discover something that makes their life better. Hmm. I don't, if you said, Kevin, we'll pay you a million dollars to sell cigarettes. I wouldn't do it, but it's not just from this deep sense of integrity. It's also like, I I only want to sell stuff I believe in. Like it's a, it's, I, 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 I'm here to help people discover things that make them better. Yeah. That's one thing. And that is you. And, and, and so I'd own that. And also say, and I love what knowledge has done for my life. I like working with authors and speakers because I've been transformed by content. As I said, my last, the last time I was on the podcast, like I was raised by a single mom. We lived in section eight housing for a while. Like life was not always perfect for us. And the reality was books and, and experiences and people intersected my life that gave me a leg up. And I want to work with people that are doing something similar for those of this generation. And so I had to own that. I'm, I am not just uh, interested, but I'm really good at personal branding. I am good at helping someone uncover and lock in on what God created them to do and then helping them to scale that at influence and scale their influence to and drive results for an organization to make that sustainable. Yeah. Sustainability is a big deal for me. And so, um, and so I think that I had to own it and say, that's who I am. You might say, oh, Kevin, duh. We knew that when you were on the podcast last time, you're talking about Tony Robbins and Dave Ramsey and 
How did you not know that? I thought I was just a marketer. See, I hmm. thought it was about marketing products. And what it's God is people. Meant, it's about I'm, I'm in the people business. And and I have to sort of me, it's been what do what needs to go? Like immediately. What what needs to get cut off? And I think for all of us, one last thing here, and I'll, I promise Carol, I'll be quiet. This matters for one thing I never knew about before until I read Seth Godin's book. And it's the idea that we have to be the best in the world. Now you might say, Kevin, whoa, that's a best of why, why is right bring competition into this? This is about mission, not competition. I say, I agree with you. But our minds as human beings only have the capacity to remember two to three options. If I asked you all right now to pause and name every shoe brand you can think about, just every one. Yeah. Okay, let's go. Nike, Adidas, Puma. Mm. Come on, let's keep going. Right? We're going to start to get really short. Okay, okay oh, New Balance. Okay, great. Keep going. Mm -hmm. Right? You might, okay, Kevin, you don't know enough shoe brands like I do. You stopped at 10. Oh, good for you. I stopped at four. There are thousands. Yeah. There are thousands. We only remember four to 10. Right. True. What does that mean? That means our ability to be the best at the, what we do and carve out our space and be true to who God creates to be in the body of Christ actually is where we get our impact. We, uh, our ability to be true to who we are and be self-aware enough to own our unique space. We can build on that ability. I can be the, you know, the best, you know, thumb in the body of Christ that God ever yeah, created. Yeah. Right. And with that, comes impact with that comes the difference and so i think for all of us strategic quitting is required i mean steve jobs put ipods out of business yeah he did invented them and then shut them down the iphone put ipods out of business he yeah. killed his top revenue product on his own so and good. so and so i think for each of us strategic quitting matters because it lets it frees us up to do what we're really called to do and do it at the highest level which that's how we get noticed so that people can actually benefit from what we have to offer not something not selfishly for our claim but we can't even get noticed by those we want to serve when we don't lock in guys it's no surprise that carrie knew off got on your radar when he when he told me and others privately I'm only talking about leadership. Yeah. And just That's to clarify that, because people will be like, it, actually, I'd never think about it, but that is the book that is sold the most hands down of mm -hmm. the four I've written. And so it would be a really smart career move to like, okay, we're all about this. And I'm proud of the book. Like Reggie and I, I think we wrote a really good product that's helped a lot of people, over 100,000 parents. It's great. But I was finding as I was speaking back to where we started that my kids were getting older. They were younger when I did it. And um, Reggie is that unique, my co-author, Reggie Joyner, really unique guy in that he's older than me, but he lives in the world of family and parenting and kids. And I mean, when I hang out with Reggie, he'll stop and like, oh, how old is she? And what's her name? And play with the kid. And I'm like, oh, that's great. You got a kid. That's, you know, <laughs> we're just different. And my kids are in their 20s now. And I was finding a few years ago that the further I got away from writing that book in that moment in time and continued to evolve, that my stories were all eight years old, seven years old, that I wasn't really renewing the content well. And I had lots of opportunity, but I just finally a few years ago said to my team, that's it. That was my last parenting event. I'm not doing it anymore, period. I'm done. And, you know, because my content well on leadership just kept filling up, 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 up. But what's really cool, and this is the, the, the full circle, is I, I get to be me. Like I'm that's not, right. I don't have this persona where it's like, gosh, I need to do another parenting post. Well, this is just like version 872 of the same thing I've said. Like, no, I'll, I'll have new leadership stuff tomorrow. And right. like, I'm working on my next book, book number five, but it is coming from who I am and who I think I will be in five years from now. So that's easy. I get to roll out of bed and be me. But that did involve a point in time where I'm like, I don't care what they're paying. I don't care what they're doing. I'm not going to do it anymore. And that's it. And so I encourage all of us to say like, you know, what do we need to be strategically quitting? Hmm. Because there is there is because there is something. I mean, there is something in your life, or 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 more importantly, for your organization, there is a cost associated with having that person or two people on your team 
work on that initiative that no one cares about that doesn't support the main folks of the organization. You are actually preventing the main thing from being as good as it can be and getting it noticed by those it's intended to serve by siphoning off energy or mental space to things that don't matter. And once again, as a leader, you're creative. You're probably bringing a thousand ideas to the table every day, which means you need checks and balances to even keep you focused. Yeah. And that's all right. And there's nothing negative about that. I think it's just owning it and saying that's the path to success. And I'm trying I help my clients do it all the time, but obviously right now as you can hear my voice, I'm very locked in on doing that for myself as well. That's good, Kevin. You know, if I can add one more thing, it would be if you strategically quit the right things, like even that, um, I'll give you a very recent example. So we just finished a parenting series at our church. And we had talked about this for a year and there was a little bit of pressure and I won't name names. It's like, come on, you should do this. You wrote the book. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm not going to do it. I've done it. I've done three versions of it over the years. I'm just not in a place where I want to do it. And so uh, Jeff Brody, my successor, delivered it. And I watched him do, because there's always like, okay, if I had to do something, it'd be this one message. And I watched him do it. And he did a better job than I did. Because mm -hmm. his stories are fresher his passion was deeper for that. And he really crushed it. And so if you're hanging on to something that you should strategically quit, you are robbing other people of the opportunity to, Ooh, get, to get even better than you would have been in that moment. So, Oh my gosh. Yes. Oh yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm, Do you agree with that? Oh, oh, I'm preaching Gary, right now. I, so. I mean, Cause, because I think about the body of Christ and I keep saying, if, if we are a part of a body, when I am in your place in the body, I'm robbing me of feeling the joy of what it means to do what I do naturally. Hmm. And I'm robbing you the joy of your purpose, of the, the, the pleasure of being in your purpose. And so, and so we have to acknowledge that trying to be everything as leaders is robbing our team of feeling purpose in the mission hmm. and feeling that. And, and so, so getting out of everybody's way to be me. And so I'd own uh, what God said to me very clearly. And I'm, and it's revealed to me and I'm not, Wanted to say that a lot, but it's true. Yeah. In this case, Kevin, your whole life, you thought you weren't good enough because you felt you had to be the hands and feet. Mm -hmm. You thought only hands and feet get things done. But I created you to be a heart, a mind, and a mouth. Wow. Do it. And I had to own that I wanted to be something I was not. And, and that's been come playing itself out over the past year of my life pretty clearly. And so I just encourage anyone else, like, it's okay to quit. Like, it's okay to quit. And whatever that looks like, you know what it looks like. I'm not, I mean, I hope we're not going to lead to a lot of resignation letters on, on next week. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everyone's unemployed, Kevin. Holy cow, what happened? There's, there's, there's a lot of resignation letters going into churches. Tens and of thousands blame, of unemployed leaders. Great. They're going to they're gonna blame some guy named Kevin Jennings for this. But <laughs> I, I think I think there's a reality that... Um, you know what it is. And so, mm. so yeah. So for those who are, who, for, so I want to offer one more gift to your community. Yeah, um, please do. So for those who are, who do know it's time to build their personal brand, they know that you need to invest in your influence online. You need to steward that. Well, I've created a resource I'm going to give to you. It's called a personal brand blueprint, a personal wow. brand blueprint. And if you go, just text, you can just text it right to you on your phone, text the word blueprint to four, 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 nine 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 so four 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 nine 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 blueprint. just text the word blueprint on your phone so if you're so if you are you are at the gym you can still get it right now um obviously you can still go to kevinbjennings.com forward slash carry I'll, I'll have both resources from both podcast episodes on the same landing page um and so you kind of get all of the library resources i'm building for all the people who listen to the carry new off leadership podcast there so kevinbjennings.com forward slash carry or just text the word blueprint to 444-999. Kevin, you're the real deal. I love your friendship. I love working with you and I love how you build into other leaders. And it's just cool to see you sort of come into this moment in your own life where you're getting more focused, you're helping more people. And thanks for helping our leaders today. I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure. Um, I'm a fan of the podcast and it's been cool to play any role in this story. And uh, for those who are listening, sincerely, uh, Carrie believes in you. Um, I believe in you. And um, we prayed for this day a long time ago. So it's really cool to see it come to fruition the way it is with everyone who's listening and hopefully benefiting from it in their leadership. 
Well, till next time, Kevin. Thanks, buddy. See you, buddy.